Hi, my name is Mark Parsley. I'm a volunteer curator here at the Apalachicola Maritime Museum. Uh, I was partly responsible for developing and putting on this Civil War exhibit. Uh, my expertise would be in the artifacts that you see here in the case and the history of the area around here for the Union blockade. In the beginning of the Civil War, the North decided that they needed to put a blockade around the coastline of what was then was America. That coastline stretched from Maine all the way around, actually almost down to the tip of Mexico, and you know, also into the Gulf. Now where we're at in Apalachicola, we're concerned with, with the Gulf Squadron and what happened down here. There are actually boats stationed all the way up from the Atlantic coast all the way around, but around here was very, a very busy place for the Confederacy. There were a lot of boats coming out of here with merchandise, uh, shipping it over to Europe to trade for weapons and goods. And what those things were, were cotton, tobacco, corn, anything that Europeans really valued, they wanted. And France and England were our two greatest traders in the Confederacy. They would send us weapons and accoutrements that the Confederate soldiers could use to fight the Union armies off. Apalachicola was important during the Civil War. The Apalachicola River was a main highway for shipping out goods for the Confederacy. The Confederacy was shipping out cotton, tobacco, grains to trade with England and France for weapons. The North, the Union, had all the foundries and had all the metalworks. The Confederacy had farming. They didn't have any kind of metalworks. They had very little that they could build on. So they relied heavily on trade so that they could fight the war against Northern aggression. During the American Civil War, Apalachicola had some interesting things happen during this time period. Uh, the war lasted from 1861 to 1865. The blockade sat out in the bay and watched the mouth of the river. And from times, from to time, the uh, Union soldiers out of boredom would come to the town to visit. And there were brothels and there were bars and, and there were small little, what you, I guess you would call, inns that they would visit in. Um, the Confederate soldiers, the home guard that were here, they wouldn't a lot of times know that they were coming in. So people were watching. They had, uh, they had civilian guards that were watching the waterways, and when they would put in rowboats and come in, there was a lady at the Ormond House, and she would put a rain barrel on top of the house, which is one of the highest points in Apalachicola. And when, they, and when they saw that rain barrel on top of the house, they knew that the Union soldiers were coming in from their boats out in the bay. And uh, they, would, they would supposedly go off into the, the forest and hide until they could, uh, until they were, uh, the barrel was removed and the Union soldiers left so they could come back and avoid capture. Now we're going to show you some artifacts that were used during the American Civil War by the U.S. and Confederate Navy. We have quite a few things to show you, weaponry, uniforms, and even some small things that a soldier would have carried on board ship. This being 1822 and being a front lock pistol, it's an early version of a Navy pistol. This was a single shot. It would have been worn in a belt like this, it would have been drawn, cocked, and fired. It was a single shot. After it was shot, it could be either discarded or it could be used as a club. This one has a steel plate we know that was put on here for bashing. And we think with this crack that we found that we found in this particular gun that we bought was used for bashing. This is a flintlock muzzle load, 52 caliber. The round loaded down the barrel and would be packed in with this ramrod which was attached to the gun so it couldn't be lost. Oops. This is an 1844 United States Navy Ames manufactured pistol. This pistol was made exclusively for the Navy. It has a USN mark down here, which is difficult to see, it's faintly stamped. They were made very cheaply. They were made in mass production, but they only made about 1,500 of them. Navy. This gun, it's a short barrel, so it wouldn't get caught in the rigging. It's 52 caliber, and it's a percussion instead of a flintlock. This is a U.S. Navy 52 caliber flintlock conversion. 
What I mean by that is, is this was a flintlock pistol at one time. This brass piece was put into this place to close the opening in the barrel, to block it up, and this nipple was converted to a percussion. This is an evolution in warfare. The easier to fire, you could fire it in damp weather conditions. This was also a naval pistol, and we know that because it has a slide on the other side that would have slid onto a belt. That way, instead of putting the guns into the belt, you could slide them on and you could have as many as you could put on that belt. They, once again, it's a single shot. Once the shot was fired, this one could be turned around too and used as a, as a, as a hammer to bash. It has the steel pommel on the back of it for that purpose. Here we have a 36 caliber Whitney Naval Revolver. This is an evolution from the flintlock percussion to a percussion fired revolver. This held five rounds and could be fired continuously as the hammer was pulled back. It was also loaded, not by the breech, but by the side port. Made it easier to load than having to load it down the barrel. This is an 1859 Sharpson Hankins. It's a 54 caliber. It's one of my favorite weapons of the American Civil War. This is a breech load. It took a metallic cartridge with a rim fire. It's a short barrel, carbine, so it wouldn't get caught in the rigging. It has a leather sleeve on it to keep it from rusting and also to keep, from when you're firing it, to keep a grip on it if there were rough weather and water was splashed onto the barrel so it wouldn't slip. The difference between these two U.S. Navy issued weapons are, this is a pistol, it was made for close quarters. You notice the short barrel versus the long barrel. This was meant to be used on shipboard action or close quarters. This could be fired across onto land, or this Sharps and Hawkins could be fired from ship to ship for longer and more accurate. This one also had a rifled barrel, where this one had a smooth barrel. Having a rifled barrel meant that the round would spin, being more accurate, having a smooth barrel meant there was no spin on the round and it would actually wobble or could veer off at long distance. Also, these two, two weapons, one was a muzzle load and one was a breech load. It would, took longer to load this because the actual round had to be rammed down the barrel and a cap had to be placed on the nipple to fire this weapon. This gun could, is a breech load and took a metallic cartridge and could be loaded quickly from the rear and snapped shut and fired, loaded again quickly to fire n repeated rounds. This is an 1862 naval cutlass. This would have been used on board ship and they would have had hundreds of these in racks for close quarter fighting. When the call to arms would have come, if you didn't have a type of pistol or a carbine, you would have drawn and had this saber at your side. For battle, you would have drawn it out and you have a hand guard here for close combat so you, your hand wouldn't get cut or you could use it to block or punch during battle in close quarters. These were all issued on all U.S. Navy gunships. Here we have an 8-inch Dalgren ball. This ball would have been fired from a Union gunboat. It's marked 1863 USN on the fuse. This fuse is a naval type fuse. It had a waterproof cap on it. This is a fired version that has been disarmed. The cap is off of it. And this, this round would have been loaded down a large barrel of a larger version of one of these and when it was loaded into the bottom of it a friction primer would have been put in to the rear of it through a port the friction primer would have been pulled it would have activated a spark which would have lit a powder charge behind this cannonball which would have shot it out of the end of the barrel this one did not detonate the flames would have licked around the cannonball and lit a time fuse in here and it this time would have been set from anywhere from zero to ten seconds a cannonball this size would have been fired into troops that could have been up to a mile away. Sometimes they would send out scouts and they would come back to the ships on the rivers and bays and they would gather distances of how far the camps and campsites were or the, or the enemy positions and they would 
time it in seconds as to how much distance this would travel. And they would try and shoot these shells into those camps and destroy whatever they could. A shell this size could destroy a small house if it shot directly into it and it burst in the middle of it. It could literally shred a small house to pieces. This is a 19th century signal cannon. We don't know if this is Civil War. There's no maker marks or serial number stamped on it. It is certainly made in that style of cannery. It's, it, it is a signal cannon. It can fire blanks or it could fire small rounds that would fit down the tube. It was found at the local armory here. And, it, and our final weapon is an 1864 Whitney Naval musket with its bayonet attached to it. This is a, this is a breech load musket. You would have put the round on top with the powder, it would have been punched down with the ramrod, packed down, return the ramrod to the musket. Then you would pick the musket up. You would take a percussion cap from your percussion box, put it on top, and then you would aim and fire. This is a U.S. Naval Civil War telescope. We know this was used on a naval ship because it's wrapped in cotton string with a canvas sailcloth around it that's tarred to it. The reason they would have done this is because under, under here is brass. If you're holding this and you're looking and the weather's rough and it's splashing up on deck, if your hand was on the brass part, it would slip. Somebody ingeniously put this piece of sail and tarred on top of it to hold it down so that you could hold and get a grip in rough weather, you could see your target in the distance. Here we have a Civil War soldier's ditty bag. This was homemade, hand stitched, out of old sailcloth. You can see the hand sewing in here, which is beautiful stitching. It was made by a sailor. Have you ever seen the big green bags that sailors carry now, the blue bags they carry on their shoulders? This is a Civil War version of this. Everything that you owned, if you were going into the Navy and during the Civil War, if you had a two-year or four-year stint, everything that you owned and you could bring on that ship, you either had to wear or you could carry in this little bag. Here we have some of the items that a soldier may have carried in his bag. This is a sailor's gimbal for sewing sailcloth. This is an original one from the Navy. It has a Navy mark on it. This would have fit through the palm of your hand. It would have sat in here like this. You can see the needles for sailcloth. You see how thick the cloth is here and how heavy these needles have to be to go through it. You certainly couldn't push that with your hand because it would go through your hand, like almost like a nail. So they made these little gimbals with a push on it. You can see the little ripples in here. And you would have put this nail with cotton thread like this and you would sail the cloth. I can see a sailor sewing this bag with something like this because this is sailcloth that would have taken that type of push to get through here to make each one. So each one of these loops would have been used and pushed with a needle this size. Also in the bag you would have had a boatswain's whistle. This is a whistle to give orders. First, first boatswain would have been given orders or the captain to give orders by sound. Now, the reason that they had a whistle with this type of pitch, that high pitch was because when there were raging storms or the wind was high and you couldn't hear a shouted order, you could hear this pitch above the winds and the sounds of the raging sea. Uh, some, of the, some of the sounds would, would give you a, a, to change sails or to maybe abandon deck and get below because it was too rough. And, of course, there's one tune that I know how to play that everybody, I think, will recognize. And I know you all recognize that one. Also, Back in the day, it's very fashionable to smoke, unlike today. Most people don't smoke today, but most people back then, tobacco was a trade product and highly valued. And most soldiers smoked back in the day, uh, especially on ships because it was very boring. So it was nice just to sit around and smoke a little pipe of tobacco. This is an original case that a soldier, that a, that a, that a sailor made. And he's got a little anchor on here. And he, this was a original long stem pipe from that period. He broke it down to make it short, and it fit right in this case.
This would have been a personal thing made. It wouldn't have been issued, but you would have put your tobacco in there, lit it, and you would smoke it like this. This pipe was actually, was actually made out of clay and was custom broke at the stem, which it was longer, to fit into this homemade case. Pipe. When you were stationed on a ship and you were out on the blockade, it was very boring. It was hot during the summer, it was cold during the winter. There was nothing to do but watch the mouth of the river and make sure that no boats escaped. And some places were more active than others, but most were very boring. To pass that time, they played cards, dominoes, and they also did something called sailor's art. What you have here is what we call sailor's art. This, these items were made out of a single piece of wood. If you can see this and imagine that at one point, this was a stick. And a soldier and, and a sailor and a sailor took the time with a pocket knife to carve these links. These were not carved and put together. He carved these links out of one solid piece of wood. And then on this one, a sailor made a little toy out of one piece of wood. And you can see that little ball rolling back and forth. That was carved inside of this. None of this is connected or glued. That ball was actually a piece of wood inside of there that with a pocket knife carved and made so it would roll and it rolls perfectly. So you can imagine the time that it would have taken to make these two items. The boredom was extreme. We also have of course currency. Everybody needed a little bit of change on board to buy some provisions or to gamble which was against regulations, but it was done anyway. These are some of the examples of some of the monies that would have been in that time period. An 1863 Indian head penny, an 1850s 50 cent piece, a two, 1865 two cent piece, and another 1862 Indian head penny. And of course, no sailor would have ever left home without a Bible. The seas could be very dangerous and very rough. Religion was very big among sailors. It was very, they had services every Sunday and they even had services in different denominations. So a sailor would have certainly carried a Bible more than likely from his home. And a lot of these Bibles were actually signed by family members and little prayers would have been written inside. This one does not have any of those but this Bible is from 1863 and this is of the size is what we would call a travel Bible. This is something that a soldier would have definitely had in his sailor's bag. Other things a sailor would have carried in his ditty bag. Uh, cards, playing cards of that time period. Everybody played cards. They played all different games. Some of the games they played uh, like war, <laughs> how ironic the name, they actually played on deck. Um, and there are pictures of sailors of them actually playing cards on deck. You'll see four or five of them sitting around and you'll see, a, uh, sometimes you'll see a little denomination of monies in there and other times you'll, you'll just see cards on deck where they're playing. Um, they also carried shaving implements. Uh, soldiers either shaved or did not shave. It just depended on, there was no really regulation. Sometimes they grew long beards and sometimes they, they were closely shaven every day. It was, it was their choice. Um, and they would carry a straight razor with a little bitty mirror in this bag and that way when they went to shave it would be their personal items. They also carried different implements for working on the ship. So if you notice, remember the sailor's gimbal that we had, there was little tool bags that they made, some out of wicker, some out of canvas, and they would have worn them on their side when they were climbing the rigging to fix anything that was up there. It was like a little tool pouch that hung on the side of their belt. Um, other things they would have carried would have been pictures of loved ones. It was very common for a soldier to carry pictures of wives, children, family members that they loved because they would be gone for two, three, or four years on these ships and, and they wouldn't come home. So it was nice to have a picture or tent, what we call a tintype of, of a loved one with you. Here we have a Union Naval officer. He has on his summer straw hat with his naval insignia on top. He has on his officer's coat with gilded buttons, naval buttons on it, with his, with his captain's insignias on the side. He has a neckerchief around his neck, which was proper attire for the day. He's got on his commissioned belt with his fuse pouch and his regulation cutlass. 
And then he had on a pair of linen sailcloth pants that would have been issued during the day. And then he's got on a pair of bro Civil War brogans from that time period. The outfit that I'm wearing today is a reproduction outfit. This outfit is from 1861 to 1865. This outfit would have been worn by Union or Confederate sides. Um, the blue and the gray was a lot with the armies, but not so much with the navies. You could have seen a Confederate soldier with Confederate Navy wearing one just exactly like this later on in the war. Now, that being said, let me tell you what, this cap is made out of 100% wool, and it's a Navy style cap from that period. This neckerchief is a silk neckerchief, which is from that time period. And I'll turn around and show you how it's been rolled and folded and then tied in its appropriate position. The shirt that I'm wearing is made out of a linen, almost sailcloth type material. It's very coarse and very thick, but very durable, especially if you're on ship. It doesn't tear easy. And there's a lot of things on ship that can rip at you. Uh, baggy sleeves to breathe. Sleeves can be rolled up if needed. Uh, mine has a, has a first sergeant's patch on it to indicate that I have uh, a little bit older and, and probably have been promoted. Uh, the pants are completely 100% wool and they're very hot. They are hot. But being wool, they do breathe too. You see how baggy they are. And this is regulation. And then what I'm wearing is a reproduction pair of brogans shoes. And if you notice with these shoes, there's no left or right. In those days, they didn't have left and right. You kind of just picked a shoe for a foot and which one fit better, you put it on that foot. But this is typical wear of what the soldiers in the bay here at Apalachicola would have worn from 1862 to 1865. The daily life of a soldier on ship watching the Apalachicola River would have been very boring and tedious. It would have been very routine. He would have gotten up in the morning, had certain chores that he probably would have done, and then after that he would have had a small break and they would have eaten a breakfast of probably hardtack and some type of pork fat. Not very appetizing, but it was very filling. Um, Fresh fruits and fish were brought in and caught as they could. Um, around here, I'm sure oysters were definitely on the menu in the day and probably eaten by the barrel. Um, midday chores would have been uh, working on rigging, uh, sewing sailcloth, um, fixing things up, uh, scrubbing decks. You've heard, always heard this thing, scrub the decks. The ship in the blockade would have been spit polished because discipline of a sailor would have been hard to keep when they're bored. So routine and duty kept them busy. Cleaning was on top priority every day. And that's what they, that's what they would do. Uh, after Mid-afternoon would be uh, followed by a break. And then they would have a little bit of time to maybe play some uh, music, dance. Dancing was done on board. Uh, banjos were popular. It was more of a picking instrument in the day, uh, a plucking type versus today. And uh, small tin whistles, harmonicas, tambourines, and even little compression organs were very popular on those days. You can ac actually see pictures of these uh, soldiers dancing and enjoy themselves. Um, and then towards the evening, it would have been more of the same drudgery of cleaning or, or some type of duty that you did, a routine. And certainly uh, cleaning and polishing weapons would have been one of those. And I'd like to thank you for joining us today for the talk about the Union blockade around Apalachicola and about the artifacts that we have on display.